Okay, so chapter four is where we're going to be starting, and we're going to be uh, looking a lot in chapter four at a significant amount of vocabulary, as well as kind of overall with chapter four, we're really going to be looking at gathering data, how to gather data, what would be considered you know, valid sources of data, how you can incorporate, you know, how bias can be incorporated when you're gathering data, you know, whether you mean to or not. Um, so it's going to be very, very vocabulary heavy, heavy centered unit. So make sure that you're keeping up with your vocabulary and you're able to kind of sort through what everything means in your head. So we're going to be starting first with the definition for us of a population. So a population compared to a sample. And for us, that's going to be a critical thing that we are, um, need to make sure that we're comfortable with. Because as we move further through our studies this year, it's going, you're going to be asked about, you're going to have to clarify whether you're talking about the population or the sample. And your notation that you use, some notation will be for population, some will be sample. You will find very quickly that statistics is very very picky about what words you are using. And if you use the wrong word, you can lose all of the credit. Okay, So again, I cannot stress the importance of vocabulary as we're moving through here. So if we're starting here, we're talking about a population. Okay? For us, a population is the entire group of information, the entire group of individuals that we want information about. Maybe we want information about college sophomores. In, in the U.S. So if we wanted to talk to that population, we'd have to talk to every college sophomore that was in the United States. Okay? That would be my population. And if I'm collecting data regarding a population, a census is going to be data that has you have collected data from every single person in that population. So if you want data on your population of college sophomores in the United States... Um, then a census would mean that you had talked to every single college sophomore in the United States gathering that data. Okay, logistically, that's almost impossible. Okay, and so what we do is we take samples. And so a sample is, su is a subset of the individuals from the particular population. If my population was college sophomores in the United States and I gather data and in my data gathering, I talk to either college students that were um, freshmen or juniors or seniors, or I talk to college sophomores, but I talk to some college sophomores that were attending school in England or in France, okay? then I'm not gathering data. My sample is not representative of my population. Okay? So you have to be careful and make sure that you are truly sampling what you are. You can only draw conclusions based upon where you sampled. So if I sampled um, freshman, sophomore, and junior, and senior college students, then I could not say that this applies to college sophomores because that's not the population that I sampled from. Okay, let's look at this example that we have down here. So as we go through these videos, we'll look at examples and we'll do some of the check your understandings that are in the book to kind of walk you through this stuff to help prepare you for when you walk in class to be able to start solving problems with your group members, with me helping you, okay, and, and get you just a little bit more time working the problems when you can get some help. So as you go through the videos, you go through as many samples as you need. You know, these are your notes. This is your stuff. Get down what you need. Okay? So in this particular sample, our problem here is that we are trying to identify the population and the sample in each of the following settings. So the first one is regarding a furniture maker. So I've got a furniture making buying, buying hardwood. The supplier is supposed to dry the wood before shipping wood. That wood that isn't dry won't hold its shape and size. The furniture maker chooses five pieces of wood from each batch and tests their moisture content. If any piece exceeds 12% moisture content, the entire batch is sent back. So for this particular problem, our population here is going to be all the pieces of hardwood in a particular batch, not all the pieces of hardwood that ever existed in the world, all the pieces of hardwood that came from the factory. The population is just that hardwood that's in the particular large batch that goes 
to this particular furniture maker. Again, this class is going to be very specific with what you write and what you say. And if you are shortcutting your answers, you also probably will not get credit. You need to kind of switch your thinking that your answer is not going to be a number. A number might sometimes end up in your answer, but your answer is going to usually be sentences. Okay, And so... Our sample from this then would be the pieces of hardwood that are selected and actually tested. Okay, so these five pieces here that are actually selected, that's my sample. And because they come from that one particular batch, that's the only batch that I can say either exceeds the 12% moisture or does not. Okay, I can't say, well, because this batch, because this sample from batch number one did, means that batch number two is bad also. I need another sample from batch number two. Okay, so in this second one right here, each week the Gallup poll questions a sample of about 1,500 adult, um, adult U.S. residents to determine national opinion on a wide variety of issues. So my population here is going to be all adult, really should be, the it would be the better answer all adult US residents so I have to put that adult in there that's a key word because I'm not talking to kids okay so my population that I'm referring to here is going to be all of the adult US residents where my sample would be these 1500 adult US residents that they speak to so the idea behind a sample survey would be to collect a valid, good, quality sample regarding the population that you're trying to gather information about. So two things that we need to keep in mind before we take a sample survey. The first one is we need to define the exact population that we want information about. For ex example, in the last question that we just talked about with the Gallup poll, adult U.S. residents college sophomores, um, people that drive cars between the ages of 16 and 18. We need to define the exact population that we want to describe and gather information about. Okay? And the second thing that we need to do is we need to define exactly what it is we want to be measuring. So you have to make sure when you're gathering there's the sample, what exactly is it that you want to be measuring so that you can ask the proper questions, so that you can have the appropriate variables in place, you can have certain things held steady in regarding uh, whatever it is that you're asking about or you're surveying about. So before you are taking a sample, you need to have defined your exact population that you're gathering information about and you want to describe because okay, that's your goal from the sample, gathering this information, is to be able to then make a general statement and describe the population as a whole. Okay? And then the second thing is that we need to define exactly what it is we want to be measuring while we're doing the sample survey. So once we have decided to take our sample survey, we need to start gathering data. Um, and it is unfortunately much easier to gather bad data than to gather good data. So we're going to look at some ways that um, basically you can gather bad data. So the first thing we're going to look at is what we would call, what we call convenience sampling. So convenience sampling is when we're basically just talking to people or choosing individuals from the population who are really easy to get to. Okay? Um, the data for that does not necessarily reflect the population. Okay? Let's say... Let's kind of go with the example in your book. There's an example in your book that talks about wanting to know um, how much time students are spending on their homework. And so the person gathering the data goes to the library and asks those students how much time they're spending on their homework. Well, that data is probably going to be skewed a little bit on the high end. Most of the students that are hanging out in the library are usually doing more homework and a little bit more studious. And so you could get some inflated results, thinking that kids are turning it, you know, doing a lot more, spending a lot more time on their homework than they really are. It's like going to, wanting to find out how often, um, you know, families are, 
you know, taking their kids to the swimming pool and then going to the swimming pool and gathering your data. And so of those people obviously are going to the swimming pool, but you never talk to anybody that never goes to the swimming pool. You know, so a convenience sample is just gathering data basically from the easiest source, which can is not, again, not necessarily going to be representative of our population as a whole. Okay? Um, and so what that will create, so this kind of sampling right here, this convenience sampling here, can create or lead to what's called bias. Okay? And so bias is basically where you've made a bad study, and you are consistently underestimating or overestimating the value of whatever it is that you want to know. Let's go back to our example with the, with the students and the homework. If I'm going to the library and I'm asking those kids how much time they're spending their homework, then I am most likely consistently overestimating the hours of, of time that students at that high school are spending on their homework. Let's say I'm going to afternoon detentions. I'm most likely underestimating the amount of time that those student that students at that high school are spending on their homework. Um, and so the re bias here, when you guys are doing, when you're writing about tests and you're just when you're writing on your tests and you're describing bias and stuff, I want you to keep this in mind. Okay, if you are asked to describe how something could lead to bias, okay, there are two things that you need to do. You need to identify what the problem was with the design, and you need to explain whether how, not just that it would underestimate or that it would overestimate, you need to explain how it would underestimate or how it would overestimate. Okay, um, the example here they're using is, uh, let's see, explain how using your statistics class as a sample to estimate the proportion of all high school students who own a graphing calculator could result in bias. Okay, well, if you think about it for a second, this is going to be a convenient sample. It's easy to just ask the people that are sitting right there in the classroom with me. Well, the people that are sitting right there in the classroom with you right now are not necessarily representative of the entire population of our high school. You're sitting in an AP statistics class. You are not representing every, you're not representing underclassmen. Okay, everybody in here is juniors and seniors, so you're not representing underclassmen. You're not representing students that, that may not take AP classes. Okay, so it's definitely a convenient sample, okay, and I'm most more likely to have a much higher proportion, so that would be overestimating the um, proportion of students with a graphing calculator because you're required to have one for my class. Okay, I issued all of you a graphing calculator on day one or day two, so I'm going to get an overestimate estimate. So I need to ex I need to make sure I'm explaining how I'm going to get that overestimate. Why estimation? Why I'm going to get that? Well, a graphing calculator is required. So the I should have 100% and 100% of our students don't have a graphing calculator. And the other way that bias can occur is with what we call a voluntary response sample. A voluntary response sample is, you guys have seen this. You've seen it when you're um, going through the internet or listening to the radio or um, on TV, on the news, and they say, call in and, you know, vote. Or go to this website and vote. Okay? People are choosing to participate in it. It's a general blanket invitation out there. And people are choosing whether to participate in the survey or not. And people that are more likely to participate in the survey feel usually very strongly one way or the other. They're, they feel so strongly that they're going to go to the website, they're going to vote, they're going to pick up the phone, they're going to call the number, they're going to vote. This is not usually representative of the entire population. I mean, how often do you guys go and do something like that? You know, we don't usually because it's not something that we feel passionate about. Only if we feel passionate would we vote about it. And so most people, these people that are, that are participating in these voluntary response surveys 
are often sharing the same opinion. So I can lead to an over as they either strongly feel like against something or they strongly feel for something. And so that can lead to that over or underestimation. Okay, so let's look at some examples of this bias concept and this different this these forms of bad sampling. Okay, pause for a second, read the example. I'm not going to read it to you. Okay, so hopefully you actually did pause it and read it so that you can help figure out the answer here. Okay, so we're going to um, kind of write out what a full answer would look like here. We are not going to shortcut our answer as we go through this one. Okay, so the problem here says, what type of sample did Mr. Dobbs use in his poll? Okay, explain how the sampling method can lead to bias in the poll results. So where there's two parts of this question that we need to answer. Okay, so a complete answer would look something like this. Right, complete sentences. Mr. Dobbs used a voluntary response sample, and you may even want to describe that response sample where people called in. So you may want to go ahead and even describe, um, I'm sorry, is it call in or go online? I'm sorry, where people went online. And you may even want to um, you know, describing this isn't going to hurt you to describe how that became a voluntary sample. Okay, and so the second part of this question then is explain how this sampling method could lead to bias in the poll results. So think back to our AP tip just a second ago. Okay, we need to decide whether it's going to over or underestimate, and we need to explain how it would over or underestimate. Right, so if we're writing this, let me get rid of this, give us some room here. So this is most likely an overestimation. Oh, my handwriting just gets worse and worse with these. Okay, so an overestimate. Well, how is this an overestimate? Okay. Well, it's most likely an overestimate because the people that voted, so somehow, and again, your wording can be slightly different, but basically the gist of this would be that the people that voted listened to a show. If they listened to a show, they probably agree with him. Okay. So the people that voted okay, were people that listened to his show, and so they most likely agree So they support his views, okay, and they support what he talks about. Otherwise, why would they be listening to his show? So people that were voted were people that listened to his show, okay, who are more likely to have the same views. So I get an overestimate of the population because this is a voluntary response poll. We're going to do a couple more examples, and then um, we're going to, we'll stop. Okay, so what I strongly recommend when we do the check your understandings as you're going through your videos is that you try to answer these on your own. I will go through the answers. The answers are not in your book, like the examples. The examples that we do, the answers are all in your book. But this, these check your understanding answers are not in the book for you, for you. So this would be a great way to really and truly just pause it, okay, try to solve them yourself, and then as I run through the answer, you can see if you are on the right track or not. Okay, so we've got two of them here. So we're going to be up here with the farmer one first. Okay, so a farmer brings a juice company several crates of oranges each week. A company inspector looks at 10 oranges from the top of each crate before deciding whether to buy all the oranges. So we're trying to identify the sample method and then explain how that sample method could lead to bias. So for the first one here with the farmer, okay, this sample method is going to be a convenience sampling. He's not digging through the crate. He's not putting any kind of effort into this. He's just grabbing the tin that are right there on top. Okay. Our bias issue here is that he, the farmer here, 
Well, the juice factory place, the juice company, could be overestimating the quality of the oranges. Okay, so they could be overestimating the quality of the oranges. Remember, I can't just say that they're overestimating. I have to address why I think they're overestimating the quality of the oranges. What could cause that? So the, if the juice company knows the farmer is going to take a convenient sampling, then, or excuse me, if the farmer knows that the juice company is going to take a convenient sample right from the top, then if he puts his t best oranges on the top, then the juice company could be overestimating the quality of the oranges, thinking that these oranges are representative of the entire thing, where they may be, may be some yucky, nasty oranges that the farmer just kind of put at the bottom because he knew they weren't going to sample from there. So the juice company is overestimating the quality of the oranges if the farmer puts the best on top. And you're going to have to write, you really, really need to be okay with writing a couple sentences pretty much for all of your answers. Okay, as soon as you start shortcutting your answers, you will start losing credit. And there's not a lot of partial credit to give you. Okay, it's kind of an all or none situation. So looking at the second one here about Nightline. Okay, so the ABC program Nightline once asked whether the United Nations would continue to have its headquarters in the United States. Viewers were invited to call right away. They were invited. So we know what this is. We know that this is a voluntary response sample. And so let's see what they said. So viewers were invited to call one telephone number to respond yes and another for no. There was a charge for calling either number. So you really need to feel passionate about this okay? because now you're paying for your vote here. More than 186,000 callers responded and 67% said no. Okay? So <clears throat> basically what we have here is that those that are happy that the UN has its headquarters in the U.S., they have what they want. So why would they bother to call? They're not calling for change. You know, people that want change are the ones that want to, you know, that are usually a little bit more proactive and, and want, um, you know, they want things to be different. Okay? So this is most likely an overestimate. of people that think that the United Nations should move its headquarters out of the United States. So an overestimate of people that believe the UN should move its headquarters out of the U.S., again, it was a voluntary response and they had to pay for it. So unless I really want this change to happen, I'm probably not going to bother to call in and I'm not going to pay for it because the, U the UN headquarters are already in the U.S. and I'm okay with that. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll be looking at more examples like that. You guys are going to be working on a project that's going to kind of um, incite bias and we'll be talking about other ways that bias can occur okay, as we go through this chapter on designing our studies.